I began this series of lectures by saying that the leading intellectual problem of the present era was to try to give an account of ourselves as conscious, mindful, rational, free beings in a world that science has taught us to think of as consisting of entirely of mindless, meaningless, uh, thoughtless, uh, unconscious particles in fields of force. Now, in the course of these several lectures, I have mostly been concerned with the nature of the human mind and the relationships between the mind and the rest of reality. But there's one absolutely remarkable aspect of the mind that I want to consider today that we have not so far considered. Human minds acting collectively have a remarkable ability. They can create an objective reality that exists in some sense that we need to explain, that exists in some sense only because we think it exists. Now, we ought to be puzzled by that. It isn't just that we have these subjective opinions, and maybe other people share them, but they acquire a kind of reality of their own. So to take an obvious example that you're all familiar with, uh, this piece of paper as an item of physics is rather trivial. I mean, it's a bunch of cellulose fibers uh, with some government-bought uh, dyes on them. It's not very interesting physically, uh, but we find it interesting uh, because it's money. Now, what fact about it m makes it money? Uh, notice that its chemical composition is not sufficient to make it money. If I get so good at uh, chemistry that I can make these in my basement, I'll get in a lot of trouble. Uh, it doesn't, it, it's not money just because it's chemically identical. In some sense that we need to explain, money only exists because people recognize it or acknowledge it or use it or believe that it exists now we have elaborate institutional structures you would better uh, understand about the bureau of engraving and printing and the treasury if you're going to talk about money in the existence of money in the united states but as a general cultural phenomenon money exists because we believe it exists if no one had ever believed in the existence of money it wouldn't exist and what goes for money goes for a whole lot of other phenomena that I've mentioned in passing. If you think of marriage, property, government, uh, social institutions such as universities and corporations, all kinds of social activities, um, think of cocktail parties and uh, wars and presidential elections, all of those phenomena exist because we take a certain attitude toward them. There is a peculiar kind of self-referentiality in the very definition of these phenomena because it's part of the definition of money, part of our analysis of money, that people have to accept it or recognize it or think it as money or it won't be money. Now that kind of problem worries philosophers because then it looks like you've got a definition of money which is circular. Uh, that is, you don't want to come up with the result uh, that part of your definition of money is thought to be money because then what's the content of the thought? If money is defined as what people believe to be money and, part of the, and that's part of the definition, then the content of the belief that something is money will be the belief that it's believed to be money and you've got an infinite regress. Then the belief will be the belief that it's believed to be believed to be money and so on, believed to be believed to be believed to be and so on ad infinitum. So we don't want the result. We've got to explain that peculiar self-referential feature of money, we've got to get rid of that somehow or show that it's harmless. But furthermore, we've got to be able to show how all of these play things, though they exist only in some sense by human acceptance, play an enormously important causal role in our lives. Uh, people spend an awful lot of their life uh, trying to get money, not, ch not to mention university degrees, are going to universities and cocktail parties. And, of course, the most fundamental social institution of all is the institution of language. And we'll need to explain how language relates to other social phenomena. So we need to account for several things in our theory of institutional reality. 
we need to account for this peculiar self-referential feature, and we've got to show that it's not vicious. We need to account for the causal role of these um, phenomena in our lives. We need to account for why it's so important to us, and we need to account for the role of language in the constitution of these phenomena. Let me just say a word about the self-referentiality. Uh, this is of some historical importance in our understanding of history. It's very important in examining the past to know how the people living at the time thought of what they were doing. Uh, when you read in the history of philosophy, you read a chapter called Precursors of Immanuel Kant. Remember, nobody ever got up in the morning and said, I'm a precursor of Immanuel Kant. Uh, it's very important whether or not people in the Cold War actually thought they were in the Cold War because people in the Middle Ages didn't think, well, here we are in the Middle Ages. So how you think of it is important for its existence, and this is often lost in our account of uh, historical events. So it's important to understanding the events. If, if we give a huge party and invite everybody uh, in, uh, in the Washington, D.C. area to the party, and it is one awful great party, and it gets out of hand, and the casualty rate is worse than the Battle of Gettysburg, all the same, it's not a war. It's just a cocktail party. It's just a hell of a cocktail party. It's a cocktail party that got out of hand. Why? Because in order to be a war, people have to have certain thoughts and feelings. They've got to have certain attitudes. Wars are social constructs. This, by the way, is why um, uh, Montezuma didn't do so well against uh, Cortes and a gang of 150 more or less bewildered and homesick Spaniards because they had a different definition of war. Montezuma and his troops thought the aim of war, as any good Aztec, Mistec, or Toltec could tell you, is to get close enough to your enemy so you can hold him without injuring him, and then later on you sacrifice him by cutting out his heart with an obsidian knife on the top of a pyramid on a hot day uh, to the great god Quetzalcoatl. And that's a very inefficient definition of war when you're fighting against men on horses with armor, with, uh, with armor and metal weapons. So this, uh, the fact that there is this self-referential character is important in understanding history. How people think of what they're doing is crucial to what they are doing. Okay, what I'm going to do then is now take and construct the building blocks for constructing a certain kind of social and institutional reality. And our question is this. How can there be a reality which is epistemically objective even though it's a reality that only exists by human belief and acceptance? It ought to strike us as a remarkable fact that when I take this into a store, they don't say, well, maybe you think it's money. No, it is money. It really is objectively, epistemically, objectively money. But it's only money. It only functions as money because people accept it, recognize it as money. Now, it seems to me, in fact, that it doesn't take a very large apparatus to construct a social and institutional reality. And I'm now going to uh, identify the three crucial terms of the conceptual apparatus necessary. The first term, the first element we need in our theory is the notion of collective intentionality. Uh, in earlier lectures, we developed the beginnings, at least, of a theory of intentionality. But I talked as if all intentionality were of the form, I believe. I intend, I desire, I fear, I hope. It was always the singular individual intentionality. But a lot of intentionality is of the form we believe and we want and we intend. Watch a political rally or go to a church service and you will see collective intentionality in action. Now, philosophers uh, who practice the sort of philosophy I do have always had a puzzle about collective intentionality. How can there be such a thing as collective intention, collective belief, collective desire, when after all, all the intentionality I got is in here, it's inside my skull, 
and all you've got is inside your skull. And what they've tried to do is give very ingenious analyses whereby we eliminate the we believe and the we intend in favor of I believe and I intend. And the typical form of the analysis, this is due to a number of philosophers who accept this. I, I would say most contemporary philosophers accept this. Let's take intending. We intend just means I intend and I believe that you intend. And you intend means, uh, we intend for you means I intend and I believe that you intend, pointing to me. Furthermore, those beliefs go up. So I not only believe that you intend, but I believe that you believe that I believe that you intend. And indeed, I believe that you believe that I believe that you believe that I believe that you intend, and so on up ad infinitum. So I drew a diagram of that, but I ran out of space and arm energy. Uh, the, uh, it's, we intend reduces to I intend and I believe that you believe that I believe that you believe that I believe and so on uh, that I intend. And, and I intend over here and I believe that you believe that I believe that you believe and so on up ad infinitum. That's called mutual belief where we have this infinite sequence of beliefs. Now, I've never thought that was a plausible account. I've never thought that was the right account uh, because my head isn't big enough for all those uh, beliefs. I, I, and I don't have to have all these elaborate beliefs. I do, uh, in a case of we intend, believe uh, that you intend and believe that you believe that I believe that you intend. But that seems to me a consequence of collective intentionality. It's not part of the definition. Why are people then so wed to this, I think, implausible account where you have to have at least the potential of an infinite number of beliefs in order to have the simplest kind of case of we intending? See, you can't account for social behavior without we intending. Suppose you and I are trying to push a, a car to get it started then I am pushing only as part of our pushing, and you're pushing only as part of our pushing. Or think of us playing uh, in an orchestra. There has to be a difference between my playing the violin part of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and you singing the soprano part, uh, whereas it just sort of happens that we're uh, coordinated. That is, it might be I'm practicing in one room and you're singing in another room, and I'm not re really paying any attention. But as it turns out, we happen to be doing it in a coordinate, in a simultaneous fashion. That is, I'm playing the, the tune and you're singing Freud, Schöne, Goethe, Funken, or whatever. And it turns out that it sounds just like the uh, performance. That has to be different from a real performance. Because in a real performance, it isn't just that I am playing the violin and you are singing. But we are each doing what we do as part of our playing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Or think of a foot over there. The answer is we are executing a pass play. But notice no individual player can execute a play, pass play, not even the quarterback. The, executing the pass play is the content, it's the intention and action of what we are doing. But each individual's I intention will be derived from that. I am, let's say, blocking the defensive end. Or if I'm the wide receiver, I'm going out to catch the pass. Or if I'm the quarterback, I'm dropping back to pass. Now notice this is a very important point. The I intention in each case is different, but the I intention only exists because it derives from the common we intention. So I am blocking the defensive end as part of our executing the pass play. Now, as I said, that's very hard for most philosophers to accept that that uh, might be a primitive way of talking about it, that that doesn't sub isn't subject to further analysis because they think if we intentionality really exists, it must reduce to I intentionality. Otherwise, you'd have to postulate some kind of intentionality floating over our heads. You'd have to postulate some kind of world spirit. You'd have to get some sort of Hegelian weltgeist floating around over us, and you don't want that. That's very bad news. That violates a principle which we call methodological individualism. Uh, the idea that your methods in the social sciences must be consistent with the fact 
that each individual is the repository of all the mental contents that there are. That is, that each, that the set of individuals individually uh, has, uh, have intentional contents and the collective contents of the community have to reside in the totality of the individual mental contents in the heads of actual people. You don't want to violate that principle. I want to suggest there's a simple solution to this puzzle. You don't need all this elaborate apparatus. The right way to see it is this. What I've got in my head and what you got in your head looks like this. We intend. That is, there's no reason why I can't have in my head a plural form of the intentional verb. I have an we intend or we believe or we want and of course that will have consequences about what I intend or I believe or I want but I have my I intentionality only as part of the we intentionality. Now of course that allows for mistakes of the form I might think I'm doing something as part of our doing something whereas in fact you aren't cooperating. I thought I was pushing the car as part of our pushing the car, but it turns out you were just going along for the ride. You weren't pushing at all. And in that case, I wasn't doing what I thought I was doing. I thought I was pushing as part of our pushing, and I wasn't. All sorts of dreadful misunderstandings are possible where I am doing something, I take it as part of our doing something, and you have a completely different conception. But that seems to me what real life is like. So our first building block on the road to social and institutional reality is the existence of collective intentionality. It's just a fact about biology that our evolutionary history has given us the capacity for collective intentionality. And we then have cases where we have an individual intentionality that's part of and derived from the collective intentionality, where I'm doing what I'm doing as part of our doing what we are doing. And just for the purpose of, the, of this discussion, I'm going to define social reality as any reality that has collective intentionality. So a bunch of hyenas uh, attacking a lion and the Supreme Court making a decision are both cases of social reality. Any time you have people cooperating, you have collective intentionality and social reality. Most forms of human conflict, not all, but most forms of human conflict require cooperation. It takes a great deal of cooperation in order to have a prize fight uh, or in order to have a, a, a law case where the litigants uh, compete against a uh, fight against each other. And most, or even think of faculty members trading insults at a cocktail party. I mean, there again, you've got to have a very high level of collective intentionality in order to have the particular conflicts that arise. Now, not all conflict requires collective intentionality. If somebody creeps up behind you in an alley and hits you over the head, no cooperation is necessary. No collective intentionality is necessary. But most organized forms of human conflict require collective intentionality. That's our first building block. The second one is this. Human beings also have a remarkable capacity that we have mentioned in earlier lectures, the capacity to impose functions on objects. So as I mentioned in an earlier lecture, something is only a, a key or a pen or a knife or a chair because we use it or have designed it or intended for the purpose of a key or a knife or a pen or a chair. You cannot discover bathtubs in nature. You might discover an object that you could use as a bathtub, but it's only a bathtub if someone intends to use it or has used it or has designed it for the purpose of being a bathtub. That's why there are no bathtubs on Mars, even if it turned out there were stones that had the shape of bathtubs. That something has a function is always a matter of its being observer relative. Functions are always relative to the assignment of a function by an observer or user or designer or purchaser, etc. Now we're blinded to this fact by the practice that we have in evolutionary biology 
of talking as if functions uh, were existed in nature independent of our attitudes. And we do, in fact, discover functions. We discovered that the function of the heart is to pump blood. The function of the vestibular ocular reflex is to stabilize the retinal image. But it's important to see you can only discover a function in nature if you've already got a sense of purpose, if you have a sense of a teleology. So it's because we value life and survival that we can say the function of the heart is to pump blood. If we thought the most important thing in the universe was to glorify God by making a thumping noise, then we might think the function of the heart is to make a thumping noise. And if we thought the most important thing was death and extinction, then the function of species would be extinction and the function of diseases would be to hasten death. We don't think that. That's why we have a different conception of function. But the difference between saying the heart in fact pumps blood and that relates to the causal behavior of the organism in certain complex ways and saying the function of the heart is to pump blood is not that some new fact is added but rather a whole set of teleological or evaluative categories now become appropriate. So now we can talk about heart disease. We can talk about malfunctioning hearts. We can talk about better hearts and worse hearts in a way that we don't talk about better stones and worse stones, unless, of course, we've assigned a function. If you want to use this stone as a projectile, you want to throw it at somebody, or you want to use it as a work of art, as an objet d'art trouvé, then, of course, you've now assigned a function, and you can talk about worse stones and better stones. All right, now this is a remarkable capacity that human beings have. They have the capacity for collective intentionality and they have the capacity for the assignment of function to objects where all functions are observer relative. All functions only exist relative to assignments and impositions. Now the third element that we need to get from social reality to institutional reality, to get just from animals cooperating with each other to things like money and private property and governments and senators and kings, is a form of rule that I have called a constitutive rule. Now let's think about rules for a minute. When we think of rules, most rules that we think of will be rules whose purpose is to regulate an antecedently existing form of behavior. Think of the rule, drive on the right-hand side of the road. Driving can exist independently of that rule. It's just people tend to crash into each other if you don't have rules of the road that will tend to regulate their behavior. So we have regulative rules whose job is to regulate behavior that can exist apart from the rule. But now not all rules are like that. There are some rules that don't just regulate an antecedently existing behavior, but they create the very possibility of the behavior that they regulate. Think, for example, of the rules of chess, to take an obvious example. It was not the case that there were a lot of people pushing bits of wood around on boards and finally somebody said, fellas, we got to get some rules so we quit banging into each other when we push these knights and pawns around. No, that wasn't it. Rather, the rules of chess don't just regulate, they do that as well. They don't just regulate the movement of the pieces, but they create the very possibility of playing chess. Playing chess is defined as acting in accordance with at least a certain number of these rules. You might leave out odd rules here and there, but basically, unless you're following a rather large subset of these rules, you're not playing chess. Now, the question then is, well, what's the form of these rules? And it seems to me the right way to describe the form of these rules is to say we have a rule where a certain kind of a phenomenon counts as some other kind of phenomenon or it does so in a certain sort of context. And I put that, I mean, just to, to have a way of expressing that, I like to say the rules have the form X counts as Y. So this counts as a legal pawn move in C, in context C. So to take football, crossing the goal line in possession of the ball while a play is in progress 
that's the C, counts as a touchdown. A touchdown during the game counts as six points. Getting more points than your opponent counts as winning. We count some lower level phenomenon as a higher level phenomenon. And those rules I call constitutive rules. Now I'm going to make a very strong claim. I'm going to say all of institutional reality, all of the reality of language, money, property, governments, uh, marriage, tenure, cocktail parties, hiring, firing, and so on, are explainable in terms of those three primitive notions, collective intentionality, the assignment of function, and constitutive rules. So let's go to work and try to put them together. Now, I like to imagine simple examples to illustrate the points that I'm making, and I want to consider the following sort of example. Imagine a community of creatures that build a wall around the area where they live. I don't want to call it a village or a town because those are already institutional, but they have this collection of huts and they build a wall, and the wall has an assigned function. The wall is to keep intruders out and their own members in. The wall functions in virtue of its physical features. It's just too big a wall for anybody to climb over it easily. Now that's a case like a knife or a watch or a chair where you have the assignment of function but the assignment of function is assigned to something that can perform that function in virtue of its physical structure. Now, notice that we've already got a combination in that wall of the assignment of function and collective intentionality because it isn't that some individual has assigned that function the way an individual might use a, a piece of wood to sit on but it's rather like the collective use of a group of individuals who might, that might use a bench for them all to sit on or might use a, a stick as a lever for the, them collectively to move something with. So we've already got two features in the construction of this wall. We've got collective intentionality, the wall is a social fact, and we've got the assignment of function because it was built with a certain function, keep us in, keep other guys out. All right, but now I want you to imagine the following, and I want it to sound quite innocent and uncontroversial because it's gonna, we're going to see it has big consequences. Suppose the wall decays. Suppose the wall gradually decays so there's nothing left but a line of stones. Suppose, however, that the members of the community continue to recognize the line of stones as the boundary of their community, as the boundary of their little gathering. Suppose they attach a certain notion of duty or obligation to this line of stones because they think you're not supposed to cross it and people on the outside are not supposed to cross it. The philosophers have a, a jargon for this. It's called deontic. They attach these deontic notions, meaning having to do with duty or obligations or rights and obligations uh, and, and such things. They, we, they have a deontic attitude toward this line of stones because they think the line of stones isn't just a mark that happens to be on the ground, but you're not supposed to cross it. It's somehow wrong or uh, uh, not acceptable to cross it. Now, I want that to sound like a fairly innocent move, but it seems to me that move is absolutely crucial in the creation of human institutions for the following reason. In the simplest cases of the assignment of function, we assign the function to an object which can perform that function solely in virtue of its physical structure. That's the case of chairs and bathtubs and knives. That's why I can't use a, a bathtub as a knife and I can't use my knife as a bathtub because the physics is wrong. The function is performed in virtue of the physical structure. But now what we imagined in the case of the wall is that the function is no longer performed in the case of, uh, in, in virtue of the physical structure but it's performed in virtue of the collective acceptance or recognition 
of the line as having a certain status, the status of a boundary, and in virtue of that status, it has a certain function, the function of keeping intruders out and our members of our community in. Now, I want to introduce another notion now, and that's the notion of a status function. Status functions are functions which can only be performed in virtue of the collective recognition of a status, and then the status enables the object to perform the function, but, and this is the crucial point, status functions cannot be performed in virtue of the physical structure of the object. The physical structure of the object by itself is insufficient to guarantee the presence of the status, and with the status, the status function, it, the status functions require collective acceptance or recognition. Now, money seems to me the most obvious example of that. There's nothing in the physics of this that gives it the function of money. It's amazing how many physical phenomena can perform the function of money. So we think of gold coins and silver coins, of paper currency and credit cards and checks, uh, but some tribes use wampum and some other tribes use seashells. There just seems to be an almost no limit on uh, what sorts of physics can be used as money. As a matter of fact, in the past couple of decades, most of our money underwent a dramatic physical transformation that happened in the middle of the night when we were sound asleep and we didn't pay any attention to it and it doesn't make a bit of difference. Most of our money is now in the form of magnetic traces on computer disks in banks. And that happened within our lifetimes and it doesn't make a bit of difference. As long as it continued to function as money, it's money. Now I want to illustrate this point by telling the story of the evolution of paper currency in medieval Europe. The Middle Ages are a wonderful thing to study because it's kind of the childhood of our civilization and you can see a lot of our institutions in a simpler form. How did paper currency evolve? Well, here's the standard textbook account and let me uh, put that in the context of the standard economics textbook account of what money is. In the standard account, they say there are three kinds of money. There's commodity money, where you have something valuable and you use it to barter, like gold and silver. There is promissory or contract money, where you promise somebody to pay something. And then there's fiat money, where something is just money because some authority declares it to be money. By the way, barter or commodity money is always a possibility. Last time I was in the, in the former Soviet Union, Marlboro cigarettes had attained the status of a kind of currency. So you couldn't get a cab just by waving your hand, but if you held up a pack of Marlboros, you could get a, uh, I don't know why it should be one brand rather than another, but you could, you could get a cab that way. And rich people would often throw a few packs of Marlboros on the backseat of their car just to kind of show off that, you know, they were pretty well off. So that uh, the possibility of going back to barter is always with us. Anyway, it, here is the, here's the puzzle. Why are all those money? Commodity money, contract money, fiat money, and what fact about them makes them money? Well, let's consider the evolution of paper currency. Originally, people carried around gold and silver, and in fact, uh, money was commodity money. It was a form of barter because the amount, the value of the coin was supposed to be exactly equal to the value of the gold or silver in it. Sometimes governments cheated and put a little less gold and silver than they were supposed to, but the, but the coin, the marks on the coin were just essentially to mark the amount of gold or silver. But that's really not a very safe or efficient way to operate. So people found they could leave their gold and silver in banks and the banker would give them a piece of paper that says, we will pay the bearer in demand so much gold or so much silver. Now, the amazing thing was people then didn't need gold or silver. They didn't need the commodity money. They now had the contract money. They had a contract which, if they took it back to the bank, back to the banker, the banker would give them the gold or the silver. Now, some genius discovered you can issue more contracts then you actually have gold and silver in the bank and everything will work out fine as long as not everybody rushes to the bank at once. That is, these pieces of paper are, as, as they say, as good as gold, even though it's just a promise to pay the bearer in gold on demand. Now, much later on, and this took a very long time, somebody discovered 
you can forget about the gold altogether and just have the bits of paper. And that's where we are today. It used to say on uh, Federal Reserve notes, it used to say, the treasurer will pay the bearer on demand the sum of $5. But of course, if you went to the treasury, what they would give you, I guess, if you insisted, first of all, they'd think you were crazy. Uh, but if they give you anything, they'd give you another $5 bill. Now they've quit saying that. That has quietly disappeared from American currency. It still exists on British currency. It says on British currency that if you take it to the Bank of England, the treasurer will give you 20 pounds, and it's signed by himself personally. Uh, but of course, they're not going to give you anything except another 20 pounds. Now what we've got here is the evolution of commodity money to fiat money, and fiat money is the creation of an institutional fact, whereas commodity money was a social fact. You see, the gold and silver had a function of value imposed on it, but it was in virtue of the physics of the phenomenon. The gold and silver were regarded as desirable, but this thing is not regarded as desirable for itself. Nobody cares about the paper. The difference is very simple. Originally, something was money because it was valuable. What we have evolved, when we evolved from the social fact to the institutional fact, is now this stuff is not money because it's valuable. On the contrary, it's valuable because it's money. And it's money because we think of it as money. Now, I want to discuss that in the light of this formula because I think this is the key to understanding that. What we have done is collectively accept that a certain object that satisfies certain conditions, namely, if it satisfies a certain pattern, it has to look a certain way, and it has to be issued by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing under the authority of the United States Treasury, that counts as paper currency in the United States. That's an application of this formula. And the point I want to make is, What's true of money is true of institutional reality generally. The state of California uh, gives me a driver's license that enables me to drive, but it isn't just my physical ability. That's not enough. They test my physical ability, and then on the basis of that, they give me a collective authorization to drive, and so on with all sorts of other phenomena. Think of language, which is the basic so institutional phenomenon. The noises that come out of my mouth are rather trivial physical events, but they have these remarkable capacities because we have imposed on them the, the status function as standing for or symbolizing. That is to say, they have the imposed or derived intentionality, which I talked about this morning. And the claim I'm making is all of institutional reality has this feature. All of institutional reality has the feature that we impose a status and with it a function that can only work by continued collective acceptance. Now you might think, well, that's amazing if, if we can do so much with that. It's such too flimsy an apparatus. How do you get complicated societies out of this? Well, there are two answers to that. We get complicated human institutional organizations because of some logical properties of this structure. And the two logical properties that are crucial are, one, the structure can iterate. You can make it build on top of itself. So you don't just get X counts as Y and C, but the C term in one level can be the Y term from another level. And the Y term at one level can be the X term in the next level up. Let me illustrate that. I make certain noises out of my mouth as X. They count as sentences of English in our culture. But those sentences of English as X count as making a promise in this context. But now making a promise, that's the Y term and now as X term, counts as undertaking a contract in this context context. But now undertaking a contract in this particular context in which I undertook the contract counts as getting married in the state of California. 
and getting married then means now I am entitled to a whole lot of other things, such as I can now take a, a joint income tax return and I can qualify for all sorts of bank loans that they won't give to single people, etc. So you get the constant iterating structure building one on top of the other. It can be as complicated as you like. The other thing is it doesn't just exist in an isolated form. On the contrary, what we've got is the interacting and dynamic forms. So I don't just have money. But I have money in my bank account as an employee of the state of California, and I use it to pay my state and federal income taxes as well as my PG&E bill. Now, almost every word I uttered there was an institutional word. What I was doing was describing the complex interaction of all sorts of institutional realities. So it isn't just that you have isolated cases of collective acceptance, but they continue to expand through time and continue to relate to other structures. Okay, I promised you the answer to three questions. The first is, how do you avoid the circularity and the self-referentiality? The answer I will tell you briefly is that the word money doesn't function essentially in the definition of money. If people think that this stuff can be used to pay your debts, uh, it's a, it, it is a, a, a legal tender, as it says on it, legal tender for all debts, public and private. It is a store of value, a medium of exchange and payment for services rendered. That's enough. The word money is just a placeholder for all of those things. So as long as the phenomenon continues to function in the dynamics of social interaction, it can, per can perform those functions, and there's no vicious circularity in the fact that we can summarize the family of those functions by saying it's money or property or government or marriage. The second question I promised that I would answer is, well, how, how can these things function causally? And the answer, of course, is we're not just interested in the fact that it's money, but the fact that you can actually buy physical objects with it. I mean, uh, for example, though the existence of money is an institutional fact, it's just a brute fact that you can get on an airplane and be in one place as opposed to another place. And the point about the money is it gives you the power to do that. And that introduces uh, the, the basic point of institutional, reaction, uh, of institutional reality. It's empowering. Well, what we do when we use this, essentially, is impose power. We impose power on the X term, or when we make somebody president of the United States, for example, or, more commonly, we give power to the possessor of the X term. So it's the person who possesses this thing who has power. Institutional reality functions causally because it is essentially about the organization and distribution of power. And what we're talking here is about the structure of power relations. Finally, and this is the last point, what's the role of language? Well, the basic point about all these is you can't do this without language. This move already is a symbolizing move. And you see that whenever you see these, in effect, performative uses of language. Uh, and I'll give you one example. It says on the object that I'm holding here, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Now, what's the nature of that claim? Is that an empirical hypothesis? If I write to the Treasury and say, how do you know that it's legal tender? Did you do a study? The answer is they didn't have to do a study. When they said that, they make it legal tender. That is, the language here is not used just to describe an independently existing reality, but the language is partly constitutive of the reality. So I want to conclude then by saying part of the answer to our question is how do, the question really is how do all of the different parts of reality hang together? How do they all fit together? And the question we were asking in this lecture was how is it possible that we as conscious agents can create a reality which is objective but exists only in some sense because we believe it does or we accept that it does? And the answer I'm proposing to that question is that we have this remarkable capacity for collective intentionality, for um, um, a collective imposition of function by way of collective intentionality, but we have a symbolizing capacity as well. And this enables us to get from what I call the brute facts of physics, the fact that such and such an object has a certain mass 
or is moving at a certain velocity. Those are brute facts to the institutional facts that such and such an object belongs to me or that I am a citizen of the United States uh, or that the language I'm speaking is now English. And the, the thought I want to leave you with is that we can show the relationships between the structure of the mind and the structure of institutional reality by showing how that reality is created by the activity of the mind.